This is a look at how broadcast writing works. We'll look first at broadcast stories, how they fit together, and a little bit of a science lesson about DNA. First off, here are some uh, pictures of folks. Some of them are humans, some of them aren't. Um, although several of the people in these photos are a bit sketchy, I think that we can all pretty much tell who's chimp and who's human. But if we looked at the DNA, just at how different they are in terms of DNA, there's not so much difference. I've seen 96 to 99 as the percentage of DNA that is identical in humans and chimps, which tells us something. It tells us that uh, the DNA that's different between humans and chimps is very important, although it's a small percentage. And that is true of the difference in writing. When we go from writing for the page, for people to read, to writing for the ear, which is for people to listen to. And there, the word that comes into play is conversational that our copy needs to be conversational when we are writing broadcast, when we are writing things for people to listen to. But we're not just making conversation when we write for broadcast. The syntax and the construction in broadcast are, yes, very similar to the way we speak. We need to mimic that. We need to sound like something that people speak, but we need to be more clear than most speech is. We need to actually be better than just conversational. And the key words in this are short. You have to keep the message and the sentences short, simple and concrete, active voice verbs, and be very clear in what you say. It all adds up to being clear. So if we write it straight, we're acknowledging that the audience has just one chance to hear and understand what we're saying. And people don't back up and listen to stories again very often. When it's on the air, they can't do that. And when it's online, they don't do that. We got one shot at them, and we have to make it count. And this is not dumbing down. This is actually smartening up our copy. This is making our copy better so that it comes through sharp on the first go. So in terms of style in general, we write tight. Most sentences are shorter than 20 words. We rely on subject, verb, object, SVO construction, and we start the sentence with the subject. Keep it very direct that makes it easier to understand. We keep our sentences direct, clear, and simple. But we avoid grammatical doodads. We don't throw in a lot of participial and prepositional phrases. And we don't throw in a lot of subordinate clauses and things that are writerly and really belong on the page. We're writing for the mouth and for the ear, so we keep it direct and simple. We do want to vary the sentence length. Uh, one of the things that infests some broadcast copy is a sort of a staccato nature, and thus we want to make sure that we vary the sentence length, that we get short, short, then a longer sentence, short, long, short. Uh, don't go long sentences back to back. That's not a good idea. And always remember that long means about 20 words. The basic broadcast story starts with a thing called the reader story. That's where our news anchor is a talking head on the screen and simply reads the copy off the teleprompter or off the script. Uh, it's known as OC or on cam, and there's no other video. We've got a talking head on screen and that's it. Next step up in complexity, and this is the kind of story we will deal with when we're scripting for this course, is the VO story or voiceover. That's where the anchor reads the script and the video runs on screen. So we see 
video or what's often called B-roll of the news of whatever is going on out in the world. Usually starting out for about a sentence on camera in the story and then going to the VO. Basic voiceover is short. Doesn't run longer than 30 seconds. That's about 80 words. It usually, as I said, starts with a short on-camera segment. Then we go to the video as the anchor just keeps reading the script. The director handles this. And the video usually runs to the end of the script, although they can sometimes come back out on camera before the end of the story. But usually it's on camera, then voiceover to the end of the script, and then we go on to the next story in the newscast. For script format, use the video story script format that's on Blackboard for you. Um, the video instructions go over on the left. The copy is indented over to the right. That's The copy is what the anchor reads. And we use Courier 12 point for a number of reasons. One of them being it's, it's traditional because with Courier 12 point, we can easily count up the number of lines and get a good estimate of how long our story runs. There are bigger, badder stories out there that you'll deal with. Um, this is advanced study. We're not going to go deeply into these, although you will see examples of them in my Blackboard materials. Uh, a VOSAT is also known sometimes as a VOB. It's a voiceover sound on tape or voiceover bite. Uh, it includes a sound bite with a newsmaker and it comes in various forms. The most common, I think, is on camera with the anchor for about a sentence, then a voiceover segment into the sound bite, and then voiceover coming out of the sound bite. Sometimes we come right out on camera to the anchor after that, so it's on camera, voiceover, sound on tape, then on camera, and just about 45 seconds long, including the bite. They actually ran shorter than that in my day of producing newscasts. We tried to keep them to 35 or 40 seconds, but we couldn't always, and sometimes they would run a little longer. But you want to keep them short. It's just about the same as a VO story into which you work a 12 to 15, 10 to 12 to 15 second sound bite with a newsmaker. There are also packages, also known as Raps and there are various other jargony terms for them. Package is where we take the reporter who did the story, have the reporter record narration, and we package that narration together with the video, edit the video to that what's known as voice track, reporter track, and uh, often those include the reporter on camera in a stand-up, and there are many variations used uh, in live remotes and reporter on set pieces. Uh, that's advanced study again. We're going to be dealing with much simpler stories, just a voiceover story. A couple of reasons from outside the news world about why we have to be good, clear, sharp, and short. Remember that two of the greatest speeches ever given were too short by many people's reckoning. One was FDR's date which will live in infamy speech the day after Pearl Harbor. He wrote it within hours of Pearl Harbor. He rewrote the lead, took world history and changed it to infamy. And he took heat because it was way too short in his Secretary of Defense's view that it needed to be a bill of particulars against the Japanese and it needed to go on much longer. Ultimately, FDR ignored that advice, kept it to just a little over seven minutes, and it's a classic. I probably don't have to tell you about the Gettysburg Address. Uh, Abraham Lincoln gave the second of the addresses that day. It goes just over two minutes. I probably would need to tell you who delivered the first address, which lasted two hours and was a real, what they call, stem winder. Uh, it was the Honorable Edward Everett, great trivia question, but that day belonged to Abraham Lincoln because he knew how to hammer home a point clearly. So when we're writing broadcast stories, remember that it's a different animal, and the difference in the way we approach writing it can be very important 
to how well it comes across. Some of the things we do with our copy to make it so that when we write it, it comes out nicely when we speak it. And first off, there is a hierarchy of style. We start out, as always, with the dictionary, with the, the American Heritage or the Merriam-Webster and general usage. But more specifically, we follow the AP style book, and where that has a guideline, it trumps the dictionary. The Kansan style book, in turn, trumps the AP style book, especially for local references and things around here. But if you're writing for the Kansan, you need to follow it. And then the KUJH TV style guide if you're writing for broadcast. And that's what we'll talk about here. First off, keep sentences short. They rarely go longer than 20 words in broadcast. That's something that you just have to develop a sense for. You also need to rely on subject, verb, object, SVO construction, with the subject starting the sentence. We don't throw a whole lot of gee-gaws and extra clauses onto our sentences. We keep them direct, clear, and simple so that they're easy to understand. We vary the lengths of sentences so that if we go with a couple of short sentences, we'll have a longer sentence following that, or we'll break up short sentences with a long one in the middle. But we will not very often put two long sentences right after one another, back to back. That slows the pace of our copy down. And remember, by long, I mean about 20 words. So long is really pretty short to begin with. We use present tense attribution. We put our titles and identifications before people's names, not in commas after them, and we attribute before we give a statement. So the attribution comes at the front end of the sentence. Here's an example. Changing to standard time is a blessing, said Bill Small, Wellington Sr. Typical copy, but not good broadcast copy. We have past tense attribution. We've got the identification coming after the name, Bill Small. We need to fix this. So let's shove it up and make a little bit of room and talk about how this goes down. We'll start out with the identification, Wellington Sr., Bill Small, the name, says in present tense, changing to standard time is a blessing. The statement comes after the attribution. That's the basic broadcast style when we are when we are reporting someone's speech. We use hyphens between initials. We don't put periods after the initials, so it's U hyphen S hyphen A, K hyphen U. Often a mistake in copy. Please hyphenate that out, C I A F B I. And when we have an acronym, which is a set of initials we read like a word. That we just put in block caps. NASA, ZIP is an acronym, SWAT team. Those all don't get hyphens or periods, just block capital them. Numbers are a little bit different in broadcast from AP, although they start out the same. First off, from 1 to 9 is in script, same as in the AP style book. 10 to 999 would be in numerals, same as in the AP style book. But when we get to larger numbers, we're going to mix and match those kinds of terms. And I'll show you a couple of examples in a minute here. We do not use the percent key in our copy. We do not use the dollar sign in our copy. We write those words out. So, $75,000. Do we write that 75 in numerals or 75 in words? Time's up. It's 7-5 in numerals because that's a two-digit number which we affix to the expression 1,000. Let's look at a bigger number. 2,500,000. Does that get TWO or the numeral 2? Time's up. Gets TWO because that's a single digit which we append to million the expression and then 500 is three digits, so we put that in numerals. Or we can go with two and a half million, 
whatever it was, two and a half. When we have the fractions half, third, quarter, those are pretty easy for people to understand. We also generally round numbers sensibly instead of going with exact figures because people won't understand it. They grasp the rounded expression quicker. When we quote people, we don't quote people. We paraphrase in copy. We say the governor says he will sign the bill, which is not his exact words, but it gets across his meaning. When we quote somebody, we quote with a recording or a sound bite. We don't very often say quote unquote in our copy. And name pronunciations get handled various ways, but they share something in common. You need a pronunciation guide, and there is one in the KUGH TV style guide from UPI, and it's very useful. If you don't know how to pronounce a name, you need to look it up. You need to find out how it's pronounced one way or another. For foreign names, the Voice of America pronunciation guide is very useful, and there's a link in the KUGH TV style guide to that. So here's one. This is an all-time favorite of mine. Many years ago, there was a UN Secretary General named Javier Perez de Cuellar, which wasn't a name I even put in the copy. I just put the pronouncer directly in the copy for the anchor so that that was the only thing that came up on the teleprompter because that was the anchor's preference. It was Javier Perez de Cuellar. That's how UPI says to do it. And that is hard to misunderstand. So whatever you do, you want to make it easy on the eye of the reader so that it's easy on the ear of the listener when we go to record or say it live.